come to punish her, you know, as, as, as a reason. Yeah, but, uh, you know. But. Okay, um, one more question, right there. How are they going to keep us on the slot? Well, there's, there's no telling. Uh, you, can't, you can't make them nail down the, the network on these points. Uh, it's a real pleasure to bring on our next special guest. It's her first creation appearance. Please join me in a warm welcome for Miss Sophie Aldrin. Obviously, I mean his baby in a way. Um, he invented Ace. 
in Dragonfire. And in Frederick, he's really gone to town on giving reasons for Ace being in Iceland, for example, uh, which wasn't obviously fully explained in Dragonfire. He's given more depth to the character, and that's been very uh, good for me. <laughs> Next. No. Um, I don't know, it's all very up in the air at the moment. Um, we don't quite know what's going on, to be honest. Uh, John Lincoln has definitely finished his time with Doctor Who. Uh, and I must say that I've thoroughly enjoyed working with him. I think he's been a very good producer for me. I certainly think ever since uh, I joined the, the show. I think he's brought it an awful long way in the last, even in the last couple of years. Um, but again, I, d I almost think it's time to move on the way into, into a new era of Doctor Who. People say, well, perhaps it will go out to an independent production company. I think that's probably true. And I think that'd probably be good for Doctor Who because for a start, we might get some real money to play with. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> yeah, um, you wait till you see what I have to do in season 26. Uh, <laughs> yes, I mean, you know, beating up the old dialect before lunch taking out a few Cybermen, I mean, it's all part of a day's work, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoy playing Ace because I think, it, I think it's time that uh, young women were represented on TV in a realistic way. Uh, for those of you who know us, we don't go around screaming and twisting our ankles in every quarry we have to find. <laughs> And we don't always wear short skirts, except I suppose I'm pretty But I hope, I mean, I hope I've proved with the character of Ace that a young woman can be interesting and good to watch without conforming to sort of stereotypes of women, which I think are not altogether healthy, basically. If you know what I mean. At the back there, in the blue. Sorry, I can't quite hear. to uh, to have a good look at, at uh, what it's all about. 
and I looked at, uh, I watched Leela, Louise Jameson, because John had said to me that um, the character that was most like Ace, in a way, was Leela. Um, her sort of, her strength. Um, not her legs, maybe, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but I watched, so I watched those episodes, and um, then I watched some of Katie Manning's as well, as Joe Grant, and I found it very interesting watching to see the progression uh, as to how the audience's perception of companions has changed over the years. And I think it's, it's very interesting if you watch right from the beginning and examine the function of each of the assistants in their role as, as um, a companion, a woman, whatever. I think it's very interesting to um, see the development. In fact, maybe I should do an MA on the subject. <laughs> anyway, uh, who have we had over here? Wilson, Wilson, Wilson McCoy will be coming out next year. Um, it's all, as I said, it's all very up in the air at the moment. Basically, all I can say is we have no idea. The brain. Yes. Oh yes. Uh, if they offered Sylvester and me a contract to work together again, would, would I take it? Um, yes, I would. Because um, people ask me about worrying about typecasting as a doctor's assistant. I think there is a worry. Um, but now that we only go for four months of the year, I'm relatively free to do other things. And I have a children's show. <coughs> British TV called Corners, which um, I very much enjoy doing, and which I present, and we answer children's questions. And I'm also known, I'm actually known more in England by children uh, for that programme and for other children's things that I do, rather than Doctor Who. So that's not too much of a worry. So I, for one, I mean, as long as I don't get bored of the part and bored of the, the uh, relationship, which I don't think is really possible. Thank you. Thank you. Right, next question. Uh, yes. How did I get the part of Ace? Oh, yes. Gosh, I can hardly remember. No, it was uh, nearly three years ago now. Um, I got myself an agent, and I was in a musical fiddler on the roof up in Manchester. Uh, and I was understudying Hoddle, my second daughter. And uh, the one who does, if you've ever seen the movie or the stage show, it's the lovely song she does called Far From the Home I Love in the railway station. Uh, and we had Tom Ball in our production, which was quite exciting, because obviously he is tender. Uh, while I was doing it, I got an audition through. My agent said, Here, they want somebody who looks young for their age and who can ride a motorbike, not to do. And I learned to ride bikes about five or six years ago. Um, and so off I went down to London, never having been in a TV studio or anything before. I had a chat with Chris Clark, who was directing Delta and Bannerman and Dragonfly. And what I didn't know then was that he was cross-casting for the two. So although I got confused because I thought I was going up for the part of Ray, in fact, he was seeing me for Ace. And he says that the reason why he saw me in the first place was because my agent had put has own leathers on the back of my uh, publicity photograph. They thought, oh, I better have a look at this one. So I turned up trying to look 16 in my little dress and a little hat. And I suppose I must have succeeded because a couple of weeks later uh, I got a call and I came down to meet John Nathan Turner in his office. And I walked in, I couldn't believe it, Dalek carpet, little models of Cybermen and monsters all around. And there he was sitting in his chair. And uh, I read a piece which turned out to be the speech uh, from Dragonfly where the monologue uh, where I'm talking to Mel about my past. And uh, he said, oh, could you do it again in a bit more of something or something? I can't remember now. And I, I did it again. And off I went back up to Manchester. 
I'm feeling rather disgruntled because um, I paid, I think it was something like I paid £60 for the train fare, and of course they're not returnable, these things. So I thought, oh well, I blew that one. And went off back to Manchester. It wasn't until a couple of weeks later, I kind of forgot about it. Uh, I ran my agent halfway through a performance of Fiddler on the Roof, and uh, she said, oh, sorry, my dinner is on the table. I'm going to have to bring you back. And I thought, oh well, then I've obviously not got the part. She said, you've got the part, but it's a lot more complicated. I put the phone down and practically fainted, and I walked out of the, the uh, phone box backstage. And there, standing right by the door, was John Scott Martin, who was playing the rabbi in our production of Middle on the Roof, and who, as you probably know, has been the chief Dalek for a number of years. And he was the first person who I told us, I've got a job, I've got a job. And uh, then, then my agent rang back and said, well, you've got three episodes, but you've not only got that, but they want to see how you'd work out as a potential assistant for the future. And I just couldn't believe it, of course. I mean, I'd never even been in a TV studio, let alone in front of cameras. So having picked myself up off the floor for the second time, I had to then go on stage for the next scene. And uh, the audience must have wondered why this little chorus member had a huge grin from ear to ear. And all the chorus were coming up and congratulating me on stage. It was a really, really exciting moment. And that's like a thought. I am from London, born and bred. I'm from, uh, I was born in Greenwich, which you may have uh, heard of from Greenwich Mean Time, obviously. And I was brought up in a place called Blackheath, which is about a mile up the hill. And then uh, went off to Manchester for three years to do my university degree. And came back and I'm living really quite near where I was born and brought up, which is very nice. Who's Gordon Bennett? <laughs> I don't really know, actually. It's an expression. I mean, I've used it all my life. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of slang English expression. There must be a story to it, and I must find out. I always used to think he was a footballer, but that was Gordon Banks, who used to play goalkeeper for Stoke City. Um, <laughs> being keen on football myself. Uh, but I, I must, I'll find out that Yes, sir, that with the shade. Sorry, I can't hear you. Can we have a bit of hush, please? Oh, right. <laughs> a very good scientist, crikey. Uh, well, <laughs> I did biology only. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I'll do anything. All, all, you know, all offers of work at the Well, not any of Yes, sir. Right, the first question is, will we be filming Doctor Who on the continent? Is that right? Well, I hope so. <laughs> I quite fancy going in with nice suntans on there. Um, unfortunately, as you know, um, the BBC budget is quite limited for Doctor Who. It astounds me how a show that can be so well received in 62 countries around the world is completely underfunded. And, for example, one of the stories this year is called Ghost Light, and um, it's been aired already in Britain. Some of you may have seen it over here. Um, there was a scene in Ghost Light in which we were to eat a meal, and what, those of you who've seen Ghost Light will have noticed that the set is magnificent. It's all set in the studio. It's meant to be the interior of the Victorian house, and it really works well because the designer just went crazy with beautiful, detailed pictures, stuffed birds, because he had to, it had to have an atmosphere of depression. 
Now, we got up to this scene at the banquet, and um, there was a line, please, would you, uh, would you pass the potatoes? Now, we were rehearsing the scene, and they said, oh yes, we've got to change this line about potatoes. And we all said, why? And uh, they said, well, I'm afraid we can't afford the potatoes to go in the kitchen. <laughs> and so we had to change it in the end, and the scene has become a scene before we start eating. We were saying, well, we'll, we'll collect them from the canteen, we'll, we'll do a whip round at, at supper break and, and get a meal together to put on the table. So, as you can see, there really isn't that much money. Um, the second question, why is the future always so primitive compared to what it could be? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I suppose mainly in these stories, I've been to the past, which has been very nice. I would like to do more historical stories. I think, you know, that's, that interests me a lot. Uh, this year we've had a 1940 story. We've had a story that takes place in Victorian times. We've had one in present day Perivale. And um, another one, which I can't remember. The life of me. Oh, yes, which takes place slightly in the future. Um, I suppose it might be to do with budget again, and the BBC can't afford enough of some twiggy bits to put on the set. Maybe that's why. Next. Um, yes, you said. I must admit I haven't seen Patrick Stewart in Shakespeare. I would very much like to. Some of my favourite British actors. Um, it's difficult to say. People look. I've, I've seen. I've recently seen a production at the Royal Shakespeare Company of Ibsen's The Master Builder with John Woods, who is a very underrated actor, if you ask me. Um, I think he's wonderful. Um, I also. I admire. Um, the work of Michael Gambon. Uh, I don't know whether you have a single detective over here, whether any of you have seen that. But that was incredible. Um, Bob Peck springs to mind. He's another uh, wonderful actor who is in a thing called um, After Pilkington, which I very much liked him in. Um, I like the, I don't know whether you've seen any of our alternative comedians over here. Um, we have people like Rowan Atkinson, and Hugh Laurie in uh, Blackadder, which I think you know. We've got the young ones um, and the uh, comic strip. And, uh, very lovely person called Daniel Peacock, who I uh, think is a wonderful comic actor, and I admire very much. Um, I think that's a good list. <laughs> yes. The episodes you've done so far, which one would you consider your personal favourite? Oh, this is this is impossible to answer. My personal favourite episode. Um, they keep getting better and better, really. I think my personal favourite of season 26 has to be Fenric, because Ian Briggs gave me such a lot of wonderful acting to do. Real, it, I mean, I had to pull out all the stops. Um, there were a couple of scenes there. I worked with a girl called Corey Pullman, who is now a great friend of mine, and she uh, plays a, a rep in uh, Fenric. We did a couple of scenes together, which which I've watched, and I'm very, very happy with. And uh, I suppose that's my selfish way of saying which uh, episode I like best, really. Uh, <laughs> uh, Hugh Laurie and Super Fry, they, they've done their own show um, called A Little Bit of Brian Laurie, I think. Stephen Fry pops up all over the place. Um, he does some wonderful characters on the radio. Um, he, he, 
that together the end of part they do a lot of their own things. So I don't I can't nothing particularly springs to mind that you apart from their own sort of double act uh, that you would see them in. I mean they're mainly together as being black but then I think I'm missing some terrible things Yes. Yes, you'll spot them in the young ones and all sorts of things like that. Oh, here's Evan. Right, a couple more minutes, so a few more questions. Yes, sir. And then madam. Oh, hang on. Uh, the man in the blue shirt first. Have you heard anything about the Doctor Who at all? Ah, the Doctor Who movie, have I heard anything? Um, yes, I'm not going to be an interviewer. <laughs> Um, I spoke to Johnny Byrne a few weeks ago um, at a convention in Liverpool. Um, it seems to be getting going. Things seem to be happening at last. And I hope they do. I mean, we've had rumours in the tabloids about Donald Sutherland to play the Doctor. I mean, um, we've had rumours about Caroline Monroe. First of all, she was apparently cast to play the assistant. She's now going to be the villainess. Basically, I think I know as much as you do, which is probably not that much, because you always seem to know such a lot more than any of us lot anyway. <laughs> yes, my name. Yes, I have one brother who's wonderful. He's called Jonathan, and he's three years younger than me. I call him my little brother, but in fact he's, uh, well, he's about six foot two, and uh, built like an American football player. And... Uh, He's a great pal as well as being a brother. And there's just the two of us. Yes, sir, at the back, with the cool shades. What do you see yourself doing in your career five, ten years ago? Oh, gosh. In five or ten years from now. Um, coming to conventions, I hope. <laughs> I would like to I would like to do more adult things. Um, unfortunately, as you may know, Doctor Who was seen in England as a children's show, uh, which I think is quite it's not altogether right. So therefore, casting directors seem to uh, think that I am a children a children's personality. What I'd like to do is some demanding work in theatre or on television for the more sort of adult market drama type thing. I'd love to do a movie. Basically anything that stretches me. And uh, Sylvester's always maintained that he has had such a happy career because he's managed to do as many different types of things as possible. Um, he's a jack of all trades and master of all that thing as well. And I, I would like to be like that. Right, that wraps it up. Yeah. Okay, so we're not really the one around. Thanks a lot. I'm sure the best of her career. Okay, Just stay up here. <laughs>